Good day to you, and when you're sitting there watching a television show, you're probably not aware until you've read this chapter that you are joining together with thousands or maybe millions of people doing the same thing at one time. I mean, you probably know that that's going on because you're part of a TV audience. <clears throat> But to be truly aware that you're joining together with that kind of a mass of people is not something that's on most people's minds. And yet that is what's happening when we're watching TV, when we're reading a newspaper, when we're looking at a web page, and when we're listening to radio, we're joining together with thousands and sometimes millions of other people. And yet the audience itself as a construct is artificial, right? Because the audience, as I explain in my chapter, hopefully clearly, is something that is an amalgamation of people's very basic characteristics. You can break people down into male or female, but it doesn't really tell you a lot about the person who is a male who is watching a television show. And so a media audience is a kind of artificial construct. And partly what makes it artificial is that we measure our audiences quantitatively. That's where we get ratings from. That's where media companies uh, place all of their investments in terms of time and energy and strategy to yield those ratings that they get from the Nielsen company or whatever newspaper services are providing it or web-based companies, they're trying to get ratings for their content that justify certain advertising dollar prices that they can charge to advertisers. The bigger the audience, the more you can charge those advertisers. And so the, the quantitative data that's gathered to try and study audiences for media is, is also biased, right? It's biased towards trying to sell a product. So really what I'm kind of getting at is the whole way of studying media audiences is, is rather flawed. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't study the media audience because we can still learn a lot from even the quantitative information as well as qualitative information as well. Qualitative information, when we ask the whys and the hows behind why people do things the way that they do with their media consumption habits, when we ask why and how, then we are learning more about the situational context and we are having a greater understanding of human behavior. If you ask somebody why they watch Survivor on television and they start to tell you, well, I like the way that people get kicked off the island. Okay, now you're starting to see they're getting a little bit of a glee in somebody's misfortune. It's not terrible misfortune. It's a game show, right? Survivor is. But it's still, you're getting at something that is deeper than just understanding that a person who's 24 years old is watching Survivor. That's quantitative, whereas understanding the how and the why somebody watches a show, that's more qualitative. So that's ultimately what we're always trying to do when we're studying media audiences. And studying media audiences as we are in our next to last chapter in this book has us moving away from the tree. The tree is no longer the, the central metaphor in trying to understand a media system. Now we're looking at people, people who pass by the tree. And in a way, this chapter is very closely related to the accessibility chapter, where we talked about when you go about your daily life, when you get in a car, when you take a walk, when you sit in the doctor's office, what media are you exposed to? And therefore, what do you have easy access to? That's kind of what this chapter is getting at as well. It's speaking about when you walk past that tree, that media system that happens to be in your country, what are you being exposed to as an audience member? So let's talk about the internet for a moment because we haven't talked about the internet that much in this class and some of the figures are by now, actually quite a few are out of date in the book. So we stayed away from mentioning specific, uh, specific statistics, but we do want to return to a, an earlier idea that we talked about when we talked about globalization, the idea of language, what languages are spoken most around the world. And you might recall that the number one language spoken in the world is Chinese, even though it's concentrated in, in one particular the part of the globe. And then we said Spanish is the second and English is the third. Well, on the internet, English is the most common language. It is the currency of the internet, followed by Chinese in the second place, followed by Japanese, then German, and then Spanish. When you look at the regions of the world, you may think, oh, the United States is going to be leading the Western part of the world in terms of internet in that use. We use the internet the most. Actually, it's Asia. Asia as a continent uses the internet more than other continents followed by Europe and then North America.
In the, country, in the realm of countries that we looked at in this book, Sweden had the highest internet penetration, though that statistic is, is probably pretty old, but it does relate back to Sweden having high, inter, having high newspaper penetration as well, if you remember that particular fact coming from a chapter that we studied earlier. So let's now go reviewing all of the countries in the book and talk about how media audiences are developed by growing up in a country. In other words, if you're a French person, if you're a Swedish person, if you're Chinese, if you're Mexican, if you're Ghanaian, if you're Lebanese, if you're Mexican, if you're if you're American, I shouldn't say that because American describes both Canadians and South Americans, I should really say a person from the United States. If you're a person growing up in those countries, what are you going to be like as a media audience member? That's what we're trying to say here. By virtue of growing up in a country, you are a particular kind of person because you have certain media habits related to that country. So when we talk about France, we know, for example, you're probably not going to be a big newspaper reader because they have low newspaper penetration. Because the newspapers are very elitist. They are very intellectual. They are geared towards people who are willing to take out a dictionary or look up a word because they don't understand the word in the newspaper. Newspapers are not from everybody there. We know that more newspapers are read by men than women. So if you're a male, you're more likely to be a newspaper reader than a female in, 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 in France. We know that people listen to private radio about three hours per day in France, but check this out. They're listening to public radio almost as much, two and a half hours per day. That's very interesting as a first country to take a look at to compare to the U.S. How many hours are you listening to public radio here in the United States, which would be WVIA if you're listening close to East Stroudsburg University. That's the, the P NPR station. How many of you are listening to public radio at all? Probably not too many. In France, it's almost a roughly even split. And we know that part of that is because there's so much avail availability of public programming because the government collects license fees and provides funding for stations to be half and half, half commercial, half public. Okay, so that's a point that I want to make now, but it's going to hold true for Sweden and the UK as well. In television, we have people in France watching about three and a half hours a day. We'll see how that compares with other countries. And overall, we can say that the audiences who are growing up in France are going to be exposed to a lot of cu cultural and educational content, but really strong on the culture side of things. We know that France is, is very big on maintaining its French language culture and its its gastronomic culture, the culinary culture, and, and, and just being French. And they make sure that media are are, con are carrying content that continues to perpetuate French culture. Now we go to Sweden. In Sweden, we mentioned a moment ago that it has high, high newspaper penetration. 88% of, of, pen of people are being penetrated by newspapers every single day in Sweden, and that men and women are reached roughly equally. And that kind of speaks to something about Sweden in general, that women have a lot of equality in, in Sweden that they don't have uh, necessarily here in the U.S., including pay scale and, and everything else. And so it's it's kind of, uh, you can see this borne out in newspaper use too with the roughly equal male and female readership. Also, in, we have in Sweden people listening to radio for about two and a half hours a day similarly, and more than 50% is to the public radio stations. 50.7% of Swedes are listening when they're listening. They are listening when they're listening to radio. They're listening to public radio. They're not listening to commercial radio. How amazing is that? Uh, we know that people are exposed to a lot less advertising in Sweden. We know that because of the restrictions on the minutage in television. We know that because of Swedish restrictions on billboards in the countryside. And, and I've also commented myself on personal experience in Sweden. Advertising is not as present in the average Swede's life as it is in the average U.S. citizen's life. The average person also, in Fran like in France, for TV is watching two, and t two hours and 25 minutes. So they're about two and a half hours for both of those countries. Now moving to, and, and when we say that when we look at what it gets communicated content-wise in Sweden, we can say what sets it apart from France is France is big on culture. Sweden is big on nature. There's a lot about the outdoors. There's a lot about knowing your environment. There's a lot about preserving the environment. There's about living in harmony 
with nature in Swedish media content. If you grow up in Sweden, that's what you're exposed to. Now moving to the UK. In the UK, newspaper readership we know is spread out across the day. So that's one thing that's different for for UK people is they're reading newspaper in the morning, the afternoon, and the mid-afternoon, the late uh, the late afternoon, the early evening, the late evening. Newspapers are just being read all the time in Britain. And penetration is less, though, than 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 Sweden. It's only 50% of the population in Britain. And we know that the, the biggest part of the readership for newspapers is 65 years and older. So we might see that shifting, the newspaper reading shifting much more downwards when that uh, percent of the population expires, so to speak. There's higher radio listening in Britain than France and Sweden. It's three hours a day in Britain. And similarly for TV, TV viewing is four hours per day for the average person in Britain. And we know that the BBC is not just one of the most visited websites by British people, but is one of the most visited websites in the world, the BBC is. So you have a public station that's managed to, to capture people by by popular demand, by meeting a marketplace need, as opposed to saying you, you have to watch the BBC. Actually, people are choosing to watch, to look at the, the public broadcaster's website, the BBC. If you are exposed to a lot of content in Britain growing up, you're going to get a lot of educational documentary-like content, content that's based around learning. Now moving to the United States, we know that the United States does have high newspaper penetration compared to Britain. 55% of the population is being penetrated by newspapers in the U.S. And part of that is because so many people are living in the suburbs and having their newspapers delivered to their homes. We do know that more men read newspapers than women in the U.S., 58%. That's a pretty big spread, 58 to 53%. More men reading the newspaper. Sports probably has a lot to do with that, looking at box scores. We know that the average person is listening to more radio than France or Sweden, but not quite as much as England in the U.S. because the average person is listening for 2.85 hours per day, listening to radio, coinciding with a commute. And we know that the average person watching TV is watching for 4 hours and 18 minutes. So that's higher than Britain. And we also have an additional statistic to bolster that, and that is the average American household has a TV on for over 7 hours a day. Seven hours a day, the TV is on in the average American household. Not meaning one person's watching, is just on. It's a big background fixture. Even your home right now, I guarantee, has the couches that are set up around the TV. Even if that means the TV is blocking a window in your house. It means that we don't care. We want the TV to be the focus. And if it means having symmetry with our outside world or not having two seats that face each other and get people to have a conversation, that doesn't matter. The TV has a, is of paramount importance. Uh, we know that advertising in the United States is absolutely omnipresent. It's just everywhere. You know, even your phone, right? Even my keyboard and my phone has an advertisement on the space bar, Swift Key. But advertisements are everywhere. You have only to step outside of your house and you're immediately confronted by billboards and buses and vehicles driving by and people wearing sweatshirts and radio ads blaring from cars and pop-up ads on web and, and pop-up ads on your phone. And ads are everywhere in the United States. So we're exposed to a lot of people trying to sell us things and get us into the to the mode of buying things in the United States. A little bit of editorializing going on here, but I, I want us to realize how our behavior is affected by having so much advertising. We constantly are being asked to buy, buy, buy. And how many of you have debts right now on your credit card? And you know exactly what I, I'm talking about. You have spent money that you don't have, right? That's how great the temptation was to do it, that you actually did something that you knew that you, you can't pay for, that you're trying to pay off. All right, so now we're going to move to Mexico, editorial over. We're going to move to Mexico now, but there's a, a distinct lack of newspaper data, you will recall, because newspapers don't want to report that. The numbers are probably lower, people reading newspapers, than, than people might think, and then they might lose those government dollars coming to the inserts, the advertising inserts. And we also know the penetration is, we can only guess it's about 20% of the population for newspapers. But part of the reason for that is if I'm a Mexican, I get that I'm going to give it to my cousin when I'm done. And he's going to give it to who he's working with and his sister and, and so on. So there's a lot of sharing of newspapers that goes on too. Now Mexico has the highest of all of the countries so far that we've talked about radio listening. The average Mexican listens to three hours and 25 minutes of radio a day. 
And part of that, because not many Mexicans have cars, is because there's just a sheer love of music in Mexico, and, and most radio is used for music in Mexico. So music is playing all, all day long as people are outside doing what they're doing. And music is more tolerated in public spaces. Music is not, oh, I, I'm sorry if my music is bothering you. That's not that way in Mexico. It's I'm going to bla blast my music and... and you know, you can walk down and somebody's blasting their music down there and that'll take away the volume of my music. That's the way it goes in Mexico. If you grow up in Mexico, you are exposed to a lot of foreign media content, mainly from the United States, but a lot of English speaking content coming into Mexico. Moving on to China now, China has high, really high newspaper penetration, 74.3%, not as high as Sweden. But part of the reason for that is because China is paying for those government newspapers, right? Those communist newspapers to be displayed in public setting in viewing frames. So a lot of the public is getting exposed to newspapers through that method. Uh, we know that, news, that radio listening, or we, sh we have suspected, I hope you have, that radio listening is very low in China. We've mentioned that a couple times. The average person listens to radio for just over an hour a day in China. Uh, you know, it's not an oral culture. It's more of a written culture with that very complicated language, that very complicated um, character based language. Uh, the average person is viewing TV for just over two hours a day, also very low compared to the other countries. And we know that a person growing up in China is going to get exposed to a lot of government, what we call propaganda in a bad way, but what Chinese use as propaganda in a good way. It's just the government informing the populace of the accomplishment this, that it's making and bringing people together. Because after all, the government has the best interests of the nation of China at heart and the people of China. I'm speaking the way that the average Chinese citizen thinks, in part because of the way that the communist ideology uh, trains you to think, similar to how the capitalist ideology trains you to think that advertising is a free method of financing media without any repercussions. But as we've learned throughout this course, there are many repercussions to using advertising as a primary funding source from the content to the way that we behave and think. So communism has a similar uh, frame of reference and guiding uh, op way of operating in the way that it guides people into a thought process. And we can see that how that plays out in terms of media. Uh, now we're going to move on to Ghana. We're going to talk about how Ghana has a newspaper circulation of only three to 4,000 copies per day. That's total for all the newspapers. And so we don't even know what the penetration rate but we do is f for newspapers in Ghana. But we do know that Ghana has a 53% illiteracy rate. So we know that, that, that more than half of the population cannot read. And we know that of the remaining population, some are not able to read because their languages are not in a written form. So newspaper reading is very, very low. However, radio listening, as we might suspect, is the highest of all the media. 95% of teens and adults listen to radio on a daily basis. Notice that I don't have the same kinds of statistics that I have for the other countries, and that's a good opportunity to point out, again, a flaw of audience research is you do not necessarily have standard methods for measuring audiences across all countries. A developing country like Ghana, there's no Nielsen company in operation there. There's no newspaper association doing circulation, so we can't get the same data. We can't learn the same things that we can learn about China, Mexico, the U.S., etc. Oh, uh, sorry, Mexico doesn't report its figures either. We know that radio is widely listened to. That's what we're trying to say. We know that in Ghana that about 65% of people when it comes to TV are watching on a daily basis. That's not that many, right? 65% of Ghanaians watching TV and often they're doing it at the one person's house who has a television. They're all gathering around it. And that's about the most that we can say about Ghana quantitatively. But I can tell you that that the one, the one visit that I went to Ghana, I saw that everything is communal. I saw a person get a flat tire, and the way that they fixed their tire because he didn't have a jack in his car was he took a two-by-four, and then with the help of several friends living in neighboring shacks, they came out and they tipped the car up and they put the two-by-four under it, and then they all worked on changing the tire. I saw this kind of scenario playing out over and over. I saw people with the TV and a wire strewn across a little patio area to where the TV is, and then 
lots of people from the neighborhood sitting around watching TV. Ghana is very, very communal. And so media consumption itself is a very communal enterprise. You don't find that many people in Ghana doing things by themselves. You may find it more and more with the smartphone. It's been a number of years since I've been there. But when it comes to TV, radio, newspapers, film, and probably the smartphone, there are many eyes on the media content at one time. Now that takes us to Lebanon. And Lebanon is a country that also does not report its newspaper statistics for similar reasons, and that's because space is bought or rented out. So we don't find those kinds of figures available because the renters are happily paying for that space. They are politicians, they are big company executives, and the newspapers don't want the big executives to realize that the readership numbers may be lower than they think. So those figures are not available. We do know that 55% of people purchase their own newspapers when they do read a newspaper. So that is speaking to the fact that they are taking ownership of that medium. They're not sharing it. They're taking it, bringing it home, probably indulging in it in a private setting, I would think, because it's in most newspapers are ethnic or religious. So it's a very private experience that you're going to read. It's also hard to get radio listening data because that's kelp kept privately by radio stations as well for the same reasons because radio stations are rented out. You're starting to see, I think, a level of corruption in Lebanon where there's just not a lot known about the media, but it's sort of understandable because this is a country that went through the strife of a 15-year civil war where most people could not even afford to feed themselves and many houses were reduced to rubble and the, the level of anger and resentment between Muslims and Christians was so high that the, the, the daily tension was almost unbearable. And so sacrificing things like having a media system that just runs quietly and does not fall apart, even if that quietly involves corruption, that's sort of understood to be the way that things are in Lebanon at this particular point in time. We do know that 65% of, of people view TV for two to four hours a day in Lebanon, so it is a high TV watching uh, country uh, for a developing nation, but we also know that twice as many females as males watch TV, and we might expect that to be the case for it's still a very much a patriarchal society with the men working and the women staying in the home, and so television is, is a natural outlet for uh, women in the home. So that right there is going to wrap up some comments about what it's like to grow up and to be a media audience member in each of the countries in this book. And that's going to wrap up our chapter on media audiences. Have a great day.